perhaps the most difficult preaching situation is when you're dealing with a hostile audience where you're in physical danger. You know, most of us have probably never really had to deal with that. If you guys have done uh, work with the, the homeless or the demon possessed, sometimes that is on the menu. But generally speaking, most people, most Christians haven't had to deal with a situation where you're preaching to an actual, an actually hostile audience that wants to harm you. In chapter 3, we saw Peter, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he preaches the gospel inside the temple complex, right? And a bunch of people get saved. Unfortunately, the story doesn't stop there, and obviously, Satan does not like that. You know, when we preach the gospel, you know, and people respond in faith, Satan does not like that. And so he doesn't take that lying down, so to speak. You know, whenever we see successful ministry take place, you know, and people get saved and people rededicate their lives to Jesus or whatever it may be, you always see increased attacks. This is par for the course. It's very predictable. You can expect it. You're always going to see opposition in the wake of ministry, successful ministry taking place. After almost every mountaintop experience will be a valley. You know, there will be difficulty. There will be opposition. Think of Elijah when he has his contest with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, right? He goes there and he, you know, does this incredible thing where he's like, let's see who's really God. You guys know the story. And he has, uh, takes these two bulls and gives one to the, gives one to the uh, priests of Baal. There's 400 of these guys. And then he takes the other one by himself. There's no other people really standing with him. And all the people of Israel are gathered together there on Mount, Mount Carmel. And, you know, Elijah says, okay, we'll see who's really God. If Baal is God, worship him. If Yahweh is God, worship him. And, uh, you know, they both prepare their sacrifices. And all day long, the prophets of Baal, they're there cutting themselves, and, which is interesting, right? Crying out to their uh, demon idol God who does not exist. <laughs> And uh, Elijah starts trolling them, making fun of them. He's like, perhaps he's in the bathroom. You know, perhaps he's away on business and making fun of them. And then at the hour of the evening sacrifice, Elijah takes buckets of water and pours buckets of water all over the sacrifice, all over the wood, everything, so that the water fills the trench around it, just tons of water. And then he just makes this little short prayer and says, you know, God, reveal yourself essentially to these people. And fire comes down and licks up the the offering licks up all the wood, licks up the stones, the dirt, and all the water. And all the people of Israel fall on their faces and they're like, uh, God, Yahweh, this is God is the Lord. Yahweh is the Lord is what they're saying, right? Yahweh is God. The Lord is God. And so Elijah's response is, all right, now take all the prophets of Baal and the other prophets. There's, a, I think, 50 other prophets for one of the other demon idols. I can't remember which one. And he says, take them down to the brook Kidron. And there, uh, Elijah kills all of them with the sword which would probably take like an hour and a half. I don't know how quick he was, but that sounds like a lot of work, but he did it. And then, you know, this tremendous victory, you know, idolatry is uprooted from the land and you're just like, wow, what an awesome experience, right? Beautiful. Praise God. And then what happens immediately afterwards? Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah and says, hey, you know, let the gods do to me and more so if you're not like one of them by tomorrow at this time. Basically saying you're a dead man, right? And after that incredible huge victory in this showdown with these 450 priests of Baal and these other demon idols, after this huge victory, Elijah's just like, he's over it, right? He just flees, he runs away into the wilderness, he leaves his uh, servant <laughs> and just goes out alone into the wilderness and he prays for God to kill him. He's just like, all right, I had a good run, just take me home, Lord. You know, and that's that's that mountain high experience and it's always... In ministry, it seems like, and in the Christian life indeed as, as well, it seems like it's often followed by a valley, right? I think we can all uh, understand that. We're used to that. And it's beautiful, but then it's difficult. It's kind of like the spiritual high, so to speak, wears off, and you're just like, oh. and the low sets in, and, you know, it's not by chance. That's not some weird, esoteric thing. That's the enemy, 
that's an attack from the enemy. He'll try to bring discouragement. He'll try to bring doubt. He'll try to do these different things. And that's one of the dangers of putting our hope in the, the mountaintop experiences rather than putting our hope in seeking Jesus and seeking his face and spending time with him and just loving him and adoring him. If you know ministry becomes an idol or these experiences, like we see in some branches of Christianity, these really exciting emotional experiences, if those become the thing that we're seeking, if those become the thing that we use to gauge how our walk with the Lord is going, then we are setting ourselves up for tremendous, tremendous pain and spiritual immaturity as well. And so we need to be very aware you know, we need to be aware that there's a pattern that we see play out time and time again and recognizing and even anticipating this pattern can help us to not be thrown off kilter when it happens. In our own lives, in our own ministry, every time we've seen a substantial move of the Holy Spirit, it's been followed by tremendous attacks every single time. You can plot it, you can chart it, you can expect it. But if we learn to accept that and expect that, then it goes a long way towards being able to avoid that discouragement or disappointment. You know, we're able to brace ourselves for the attack that we know will be coming every time successful ministry takes place. Think about it. If I sneak up on you from behind and I shove you, you're going down, right? You're going to fall. But if you know I'm about to shove you, right? If you see it and you know, you're like, oh, here he comes. He's going to shove me. You're able to brace yourselves, right? And then you're less likely to fall. You're more likely to be able to stay on your feet. And so in this morning's text, we'll see this victory followed by counterattack dynamic play out. And we'll also see in this morning's text, not only the boldness of the apostles, but we'll also explore the source of that boldness it's not very helpful for us if we see this boldness that these apostles have and then don't learn how to do it ourselves. The most annoying sermons ever are the ones where they give you this outstanding spiritual truth and then don't tell you how to do it. You're just like, oh, that was amazing. I want that. Thank you for not telling me how to get that. That's priceless. So, you know, boldness is a thing that's beautiful. We would love to all be bold for Jesus Christ, I think, but at times it can be uh, elusive. You know, it sounds good on paper and you'll get all ready to go out ministering, uh, ministering or evangelizing or what have you. And then you're in the thick of it and you're like, oh, right. You, the boldness flees. You're like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go back home. This is, this is daunting because for most of us, boldness does not come naturally. You know, it's, it doesn't come easily to us to be bold. It can be a struggle. It can be, it can be a battle. The Bible tells us that the flesh wars against the spirit, you know, and in this morning's text, we'll go over what the Bible points to as the source for boldness in the Christian life. And lastly, we'll also touch on a rather contentious topic in our present culture. And that is, does the Bible actually say that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, the only way to heaven? You know, half the churches, I think that's being conservative, half the churches in the world today would say, no, there are many ways to come to God. But does that line up with what the Bible teaches? So this morning, you know, we'll have something for everyone. So let's just dive right in. And of course, we will do that by first reading over this morning's text. We will be in Acts chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 1, and we'll go all the way to verse 13. So it says, now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. It came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, 
by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Awesome. We'll start in verses 1 through 3. We'll take that chunk first. It says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed, that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. For obvious reasons, the enemy of our soul does not like it when we preach the gospel. And that makes sense. It's pretty obvious. We can plainly see, you know, from the actions of the religious leaders here in verse 2, that Satan also doesn't like it when we preach the resurrection of the dead. That is a doctrine that Satan does not like. I'm sure you guys, many of you guys, watched the J.D. Farag video when he was talking about the rapture and the demon-possessed person started screaming and freaking out, and they had to actually stop the service and go do an exorcism. Yeah, Satan does not like it when we talk about the gospel, for obvious reasons, that one makes sense. But Satan also doesn't like it when we talk about the end times or when we talk about the resurrection of the dead. Those are things that Satan does not like. Why? Well, for the same reason, both of those. With the resurrection, the gospel's obvious, right? But the resurrection of the dead and the end times, those are both very obvious things why Satan doesn't like them. Because the reality of the resurrection, guys, the reality that each and every one of us will rise from the dead and live forever, either in heaven or hell, in physical bodies, really, not like some ethereal, we think of heaven as like the fog machine place, right? Where it's like this ethereal place where angels are on clouds playing harps. Yeah, no, this is the place we see through the glass dimly, the Bible tells us. That'll be the place of extreme clarity. It'll be like waking from a dream, right? It'll be like, oh, wow. For everybody that goes to hell, it'll be like waking from a good dream to a horrible reality. For us, it'll be like waking from a nightmare to be with Jesus. We're like, (laughs) you know, it's going to be great, right? And if we recognize that, if, if we believe that, if we really, really, truly believe that, then that should dramatically, that will dramatically impact the way that we live out our day-to-day lives. And if it doesn't impact the way that we live out our day-to-day lives, then we might not believe that as much as we say we do. You know, we always give the example of... Uh, the, tri- the, the trips, right? The two vacations that you're offered. One of them is a vacation to Detroit with first class airfare. The other one is a vacation to Hawaii, uh, seated between like a fat, stinky guy and a crying baby, right? And most people are stupid. Most people are like, I'll go to Detroit on the first class ticket with, yeah, I got filet mignon. Uh, I'm able to sit up in the first class and stretch my legs. This is great. And the wise people are like, how long are we going for? In the small print, it's like forever. You're like, oh, I'm moving to Detroit. You're like, yes, you're moving to Detroit. Oh, how long is the flight? couple hours. You're like, ooh. But the wise people are like, huh, I think I'll go to Hawaii. Back before Hawaii was uh, not the best place, but it used to be great, kids. But yeah, Hawaii, right? Obvious choice. You'd be like, of course, let's do paradise. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. But nowadays, most people choose the here and now, right? Most people now are just like, what? A a bottomless champagne in the first class? This is great. Lobster, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, and they never even bring it out. 
because Satan always lies, right? He's like, yeah, that lobster's still cooking. You're like, we're landing. He's like, mm-hmm, ha, ha, ha. You know, that's, it never gives it, right? It never comes. Satan holds that as a carrot on a stick over your life. You'll be happy if you could just get high one more time, if you could just sleep with one more girl, if you could just, whatever, get a little bit more money. Yeah, he never, it never makes you happy, does it? No, of course not. But Jesus, he promises us eternal joy, and forget all that, his presence, which as you get closer to Jesus, when you're young in your faith, you're like, man, I want to go to heaven. That sounds amazing. When you get more mature in your faith, you're like, I don't even care where I'm going as long as Jesus is there. I just want to be with Jesus. And he promises us himself. We always talk about Genesis chapter 15, verse one, where God takes, you know, Abraham out to look at the stars in the desert at night with no light pollution. Imagine, right? And he's looking up there at the, what we call the Milky Way. God knows what it really is. Who knows? I believe nothing I see on anything anymore except what I read in this book. (laughs) But we look up at the stars and he says, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Like, wow, that's it. The more, the closer we get to Jesus, the more we're just like, I don't care about the perks package. I just want to be with Jesus. And he offers us himself, right? And that's the most beautiful thing we can imagine. And if we truly believe that we're going to rise again from the dead and live forever, either in heaven or hell, yeah, that's going to change us. We're not going to keep on living the same life that we lived. Uh, it's Mark Cahill. He has this awesome analogy. Those of you who have read his, his books, you know, One Heartbeat Away and One Second After or whatever I think it is. Uh, one heartbeat away for sure. That's one of them. Is the other one one second after or something? Wait. One, thing you can't do one thing you can't do in heaven. Yes. And that's when the other one is uh, one heartbeat away. Yes. And so if you read those books, he gives an analogy of like a kid who comes late to his job and he's like, sorry, I'm late. I got hit by a logging truck. <laughs> You're like, no, you didn't. You're like, if you got hit by a logging truck or is it, I think it's Paul Washer who says that in one of his messages. It might be Paul Washer, huh? I think it's Paul Washer in his shocking message. <laughs> Uh, but he says, you know, I'm late cause I got hit by a logging truck and it's like, no, you didn't. If you got hit by a logging truck, we'd be able to tell number one, you'd be dead. Number two, you'd be like flat as a pancake. Right. But that's how people are nowadays. We're like, I got saved. I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I'm born again. And you're like, you're holding a joint. You're like, well, you know, nobody's perfect, man. Only God can judge me. You're like, what? I think I would say that is right. But how, who's bigger, God or a logging truck? And if we had a real encounter with Jesus Christ, wouldn't it change us? Didn't the old man pass away? Isn't that what born again means? Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he's not going to heaven. People will try to explain their way out of that. There's many pulpits in town who will. I'm not going to. That's what it says. And that's what it means. And we can't go on living in sin. If we truly love Jesus, we won't want to. And if we're not of that mindset, uh, fall on your knees and repent, which means have a change of heart and recognize that you need Jesus, not the feel-good, churchianity, trendy church version of Jesus where you can keep living in sin, but the real Jesus where you give him your life and he gives you eternal life. Because if you have a true glimpse of what is being offered and what's at stake and the reality of our present plight, you're not going to care about these other things. That's not to say you won't be tempted. You will. But with every temptation, God provides a way of escape. And most of the time, it's going to be the thought in your mind thinking, this is vomit compared to Jesus. This is going to break my fellowship, not my relationship, but my fellowship with Jesus. And I don't want to do that. I'd rather be close to Jesus than be, you know, drunk for a few hours and then feel sick the next day or whatever it may be, right? It's the same reason living in light, uh, in reality and living in light of eternity and recognizing that we're going to be resurrected. It's that kind of concept is the same reason that Satan hates it when we talk about the end times, guys, because if we believe that Jesus is coming back at any moment, we'll live radically different lives. It's the same kind of thing. Remember church, the The disciples believed both that Jesus was coming back imminently at any moment, and they also believed that they would live forever, the resurrection of the dead, either in heaven or in hell. They believed those things. They believed that Jesus could return at any moment, and the disciples clearly believed in the resurrection of the dead. Did it affect the way 
that they lived their lives. 100%, right? Radically so. Do you think Satan liked that? Probably not very much, right? Now, contrast that with the Sadducees. Did the Sadducees believe in the resurrection of the dead? No, it's always easy to remember. They're sad, you see, because they do not believe in anything supernatural. They completely rejected the Old Testament writings aside from the five books of Moses. So they didn't believe in Daniel chapter 12. What is it? Verses one through three, right? Where it talks about we'll all arise in the, from the dust and some to everlasting uh, contempt and others to everlasting reward. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars in the firmament forever and ever. Right? They didn't believe that. Did that affect the way... I butchered it, I know. Did that affect the way that the Sadducees lived their lives? You better believe it. The Sadducees were all about prestige and power and money and respectability. They weren't afraid of having to stand in front of God and living forever, either in heaven or in hell. And so their minds were set on earthly, carnal, selfish things. And so you think they're freaking out now? Because remember, one of the things they wanted was power, was influence, respect. And now we have 5,000 men, so probably 20,000 people when you count their families, right? Who've left that whole temple system because these guys are preaching in Jesus Christ the resurrection of the dead. So not only do the Pharisees not believe in this, but they see their power slipping away too. So you can understand how they're, they're freaking out. They rejected everything supernatural, and that denial of the resurrection changed the way that they lived their lives. They were all about the temporary things, and so it obviously makes sense that the enemy of our souls would seek to hinder the preaching of the resurrection of the dead. Take a look at verses 4 through 7. However, many of those who heard the word, notice it's the word, it's the word of God that changes people. They heard the word and they believed and the number of the men, not counting the families, came to be about 5,000. Verse 5, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, scribes, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? These guys are now pretty upset because 5,000 dudes, 20,000 people, we figure, something like that, have now gotten saved since that revival at Pentecost. So these guys aren't very happy. These are not happy campers, these religious leaders. And now they're standing in front of Peter and John, and they are starting to freak out, right? The whole group of them gathers to interrogate Peter and John, and they basically ask in verse 7, by whose authority they did this miracle. That's basically what they're saying. When we see the word name in the Bible, think like name, power, power authority. Uh, whose authority did you do this on? Whose identity is behind this? What's the source of power you're using? The source of the authority that you're using to do this? They're basically insinuating, it's between the lines, but they're basically insinuating that this isn't from God. And take a look at how Peter and John respond. Take a look at verses 8 through 10. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we are judged, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. So this is pretty gutsy, right? They're not just trying to get out of it like a lot of us probably would and just be like, all right, let's, we're going to pull some punches here. We're going to, we're going to tone it down a little, 
Remember, these are guys are the architects of the crucifixion of Jesus, and they know these guys are followers of Jesus. This is not a safe situation. So it's pretty bold, it's pretty gutsy for these guys to stand in front of the religious leaders and preach the gospel. And verse 8 makes it clear that it's not that Peter and John are all fired up. It's that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is moving Peter to say these things. This is the Holy Spirit, filling afresh to overflowing so that Peter can be used, enabling him to preach the gospel with boldness to Christ's enemies. Like, imagine how crazy this would be, like we talked about at the beginning. It's easy to be bold when you're looking in the mirror and you're planted out, you're like, I'm going to say this, I'm going to go preach the gospel, it's going to be great. And then you're there and the person is just like rolling their eyes. They're just like, all right, come on, hurry up. You're like, uh, uh. But imagine, they're preaching the gospel to guys that want to kill them. So these guys aren't exactly their friends. And Peter doesn't mince his words either. He preaches the gospel uncompromisingly. He even calls them out for crucifying Jesus. Like, that's gnarly. Imagine saying this to these guys. I don't think they were just sitting there like, okay, okay. They were probably gnashing their teeth, like, just like, what did this guy just say to us? Imagine... Guys, the hard things that God has called the disciples to do. When you read through the book of Acts, you're just like, we we read it and we just, you know, go about our day and have lunch afterwards or whatever, right? No, they actually had to do this. Imagine being the disciples and God calling them to do all these crazy things that we see in the book of Acts. I don't think this was easy stuff that they wanted to do. I think this was stuff that the Holy Spirit was moving them to do. And in our own lives, guys, God, the Holy Spirit, will move you to do things that you do not always want to do. He'll call you not to just do hard things, but at times to say hard things with love. Peter wasn't taking them to task. Peter was pleading with them, explaining to them their error in a way that, Again, gives glory to Jesus, gives glory to God for the miracle rather than themselves. Because they're thinking like, oh, you guys did this in your own power or the power of demons or whatever, right? They even said, you cast out miracles by the prince of demons. You, pick, you cast out demons by the prince of demons, right? They said that to Jesus. They're kind of implying the same kind of thing here. And so, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing for Peter to say this, but I don't think he was saying this in a way that was like castigating them. I think it was full of love. I think he was pleading with these guys. And, you know, we get a hint of that in verse 11, where Peter points out that this was God's plan all along. This is what the prophecy is foretold. Take a look at verse 11. It says, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name uh, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I don't think Peter's like rubbing their noses in it trying to humiliate these guys, I think he's actually trying to reach them with the gospel, which is why he immediately steers them back to Bible prophecy. You know, he's hoping that they can see that this was God's original plan for salvation from the very beginning. And as a punctuation on that theme, he gives us verse 12, right? Where he says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's making the point that even them, the religious leaders, they can't just continue with the sacrificial system or continue trusting in Moses, which is very much what the Sadducees did, if they want to be saved. That they actually have to come to God. They have to come to Jesus. They have to repent. They have to have a change of heart because they did not have soft hearts towards Jesus, right? They had hardened their hearts towards Jesus. And that's the message today that we have as well, right? We need to be clear to people that the Bible is very clear. There's no other way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to God. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But there was no other way. And he drank the cup of the wrath of God, which was actually meant for us. That's the cup of wrath that we should have had to drink, right? 
all other religions, all other worldviews, all other paths lead you to eternal separation from God in the lake of fire, in a prison that was created for the devil and the fallen angels who followed him in his rebellion against God at the beginning of time. Nobody wants to go there in their right mind. But there's only one way to escape that. You have to come to God his way. He's God. You know, even if you want to come to God in your own righteousness while rejecting God's instructions on how he wants us to come to him as billions of people stubbornly do, or even if we pay lip service to God, but then still live our lives like the devil. We live our lives like the rest of the world, although we pay lip service. I'm a Christian. Look, I got a cross necklace, you know, or whatever it may be, right? And there's hundreds of millions of people who do that as well. Imagine if they were offering free tickets to an amusement park, right? They're like, all right, anybody who wants can come. It's free. All you got to do is get the ticket. And you're like, I got an idea. I'm going to jump the fence. I don't want a ticket. Like, the ticket's free. You don't have to jump the fence. If you jump the fence, you're getting arrested. They're like, well, I'm jumping the fence. I don't want to get a ticket. Like, this is how people are. It's it's really bizarre. God offers us all free salvation through Jesus Christ, and all we have to do is come to him and accept him and love him. It's the best deal imaginable. That's why we call it the gospel. That's why we call it the good news. But so many people in this world, it's like that Frank Sinatra song. I had it my way all the way into hell. Like, great idea. Like, no, this is not Burger King. You can't have it your way. God's not like, all right, whatever you guys want. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, you can come that way. Oh, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, every road leads to God. No, that's false. That's a lie from Satan. Every road leads to hell. The Bible's very clear. Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and there are few that find it. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Satan's always trying to sell us a bill of goods. He wants to tell people that we can do whatever we want, live however however we want, you know, go on sinning, worship other God, whatever it may be, and still be right with God. You know, why would a loving God send people to hell? Like, it's the most loving thing he can do. Imagine if we forced everyone to come worship Jesus and they hate him. Does that sound loving? Do you think the people who want to shake their fist at God want to go hang out with Jesus forever? They wouldn't want that, right? If you gave them a choice, do you want to go hang out with Jesus forever? They'd be like, no, hard pass, right? What do you, what do you think heaven is? Hanging out with Jesus forever. Now, if they understood who Jesus truly was, but they love their sin, the Bible tells us in John 3, 19, they don't want to come to him because they love their sin more than they love him because their deeds are dark. They don't want the light to expose it. It's tragic, but God gives us free will because the only real meaningful relationship we can have with people is always, only, ever based upon free will. You know, I didn't, when I found my wife, I didn't go out with a club and club her over the head and then drag her back to my cave. Like, no, there was free will involved. I just emotionally manipulated her with flowers and chocolates and these kinds of things. No, I'm kidding. But you know what I mean? Like, no, it's got to be, it's got to be willing. Otherwise there's a, like we say, there's a whole host of criminal charges that go along with that if you're not trying to do it that way. And so why would we think God would be any different? God wants to give everyone a chance to come to him and it's a free ticket. All you have to do is accept it, but you do have to accept it, right? And so tragically, so many people do not want to come through Jesus Christ, but the Bible is clear, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other way. Verse 13, bringing it together. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, They marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Like we always say, guys, people can tell if you're spending time with Jesus. Everyone can. It's very obvious if you're spending time with Jesus, because you can't spend time with Jesus and be unchanged. It's like the logging truck analogy. You just can't do it. It's not not possible. Now, it is possible that you can spend time with a Jesus of your own creation 
who's cool with your sin or the Jesus who's your homeboy or whatever. He's your buddy. He's like, yeah, Jesus is cool with my sin. When I pray, I say, yo, hey, what up, God? You know, like, yeah, no, that's not how you talk to the king of the universe. Like, imagine the, the disconnect with thinking that you can talk to God that way. Like, you had to kill an animal to come before God in the Old Testament. You couldn't just be like, oh, yo, hey, what's up? Like, no, your sin separates you from God. And the only way that we can come boldly before the throne of grace is because Jesus, the blood of Jesus, God sent his son, the son of God, God the son, to die on the cross to pay for your sins. That's a pretty high cost. How many of you guys remember uh, pay phones? Guys, remember when you'd have to pump a, first it was like, I remember, I'm, I'm a millennial, but I remember first it was 20 cents. And then it went to a quarter. Then they're like, all right, 35 cents. And then they're just like, you know what? We don't even want you having pay phones. We're just getting rid of all of them. You're just like, wait, what? But ima- you guys remember sometimes you'd try to call long distance on a pay phone and it would just be like pump in change. Like most expensive phone call you can ever make is to God. How much did it cost? The blood of his son. That's a very expensive long distance phone call. And now we're just like, oh, yo, hey, what up, God? Yo, it's me. Like, no. You're talking to the ceiling. God's like, you're adorable. Look at you go. No, that's not how it works. It's a very serious thing. But when we do spend time with Jesus, it changes us. And we can come boldly before the throne of grace in Jesus Christ because he paid the price for our sins. That middle wall of partition is now broken down. The veil was torn on the cross, right? And people can tell if you're spending time with Jesus. People can tell if you're not spending time with Jesus. When people are not spending time with Jesus, it is not a good thing. You can see it in their lives. And when they are spending time with Jesus, it's a good thing. You can see that in their lives as well. Think about it, guys. It would have been far easier for the for Peter and Paul, uh, Peter, Peter and Paul, Peter and John standing here before the religious authorities, it would have been a lot easier for them to tread lightly in this situation, you know, not make any waves, but the love of Christ compels us. That boldness that comes from spending time with Jesus Christ, notice it didn't make them mean and legalistic and jerks and these kinds of things. It didn't make them self-righteous. It made them broken for the lost to the point where they're now risking their own lives to preach the gospel to the guys that were the masterminds behind the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Think how incredible this is. And when I talk about, you know, it's the love of Christ that compels us, I don't mean it's our love for Christ. It's Christ's love for us. We love because he first loved us, and that love changes us. It gets us, it gives us a heart to reach the lost. It gives us that boldness that we see in this morning's text You know, frankly, let's be real, guys. Spending time with Jesus is the only way that the Christian life actually works. If you're trying to live out the Christian life and you are not spending time with Jesus, here's how it's going to feel. Try this on. See if it fits. You're going to feel like you're constantly treading water. You're going to feel like you're struggling to stay afloat. You're going to feel like you're going to be wondering why you're having so much difficulty living out the Christian life, wondering why every day you feel dry like you're in a spiritual desert, like a wasteland. You're going to be wondering why you're feeling exhausted and overwhelmed. Uh, It's pretty simple. Are you spending time with Jesus? Are you spending time in his word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you spending time in fellowship? Are you spending time in worship, just desiring him, just adoring him, just delighting in him. If you're not doing that, you're going to feel like you're in a spiritual wasteland. You're going to feel dry and parched and overwhelmed and over it. And you're going to be like, I can't do this. The old life is beckoning me back. I'm just going to go climb back into the grave. You're going to be like Elijah when he's like, Lord, just kill me. It's not a good place to be. The only way this works, guys, 
is by spending time with Jesus. I've often quoted an old wise pastor who's now since gone home to be with the Lord. And he said, joy is the flag that flies when the king is seated on the throne. Joy is the flag that flies when the king is seated on the throne. And when we're seated on the throne of our lives, it is a miserable time. It is a miserable way to live the Christian life. Doesn't work. And furthermore, that's not the option. God doesn't give us like, all right, you could do this or you could do this. Like, no, that's not the Christian life. The Bible's clear that we're supposed to lay down our lives, that we're supposed to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, that the old man is dead, that we're we're dead and our lives are hidden in Christ and God, and that the life we now live is for the Son of God who loves us and gave himself for us. That's the Christian life. And if we're not doing that, if we are seated on the throne of our lives instead of Jesus seated on the throne of our lives, we're going to have a miserable, miserable go at it. It's going to be terrible. Church, I plead with you guys, be all in for Jesus Christ. We are so close. Spend time with Jesus Christ. Delight in Jesus. Delight in Jesus. He is your shield and your exceedingly great reward. We look around the world today. You guys know you turn on the news. <laughs> we are so close. Every day I feel like I'm, I flipped on halfway through the Left Behind movie or something. I'm just like, oh, that happened in the world today? Like, <laughs> and then uh, the church is like, nope, all that was fulfilled in uh, 70 AD. And you're just like, oh, well, that's weird. It's being fulfilled again, huh? That's kind of weird. Kind of awkward. I don't know. It's happening again. Yeah, the whole world's like, peace, peace. We make peace in Israel. Everything will be fine. And they're like, by the way, let's all attack Russia. Maybe we can get them to nuke us. This will be great. I don't know. I mean, we're so close. Is this the time? Imagine you're like baking a cake. You know, it's been in the oven for 44 minutes and the timer's set for 45 minutes. You just throw up your hands. You're like, I give up. You know what? Forget this. Turning off the oven. I'm throwing it in the trash. (laughs) You're like, well, are you you sure? Like, I'm pretty sure one more minute from now, we're going to get to eat the cake. And you're like, yeah, I don't even care. I'm going to McDonald's. It's like, okay, that's not food. Don't eat that. Okay, well. But, you know, that's what the people do that are living the Christian life, not spending time with Jesus. And then they're just like, I'm going to throw in the towel. I go a fishing. Right, like the disciples after Jesus is crucified. I go fishing. I'm going back to the old life. The worst part is God loves you too much to let you be happy in the old life. You're ruined for this world now. It's not going to work. You're going to be like, man, this crack does not feel the same. Or whatever, right? It's, it's, it takes the fun out of it all, right? Because you know you have something better. It's like that C.S. Lewis quote we love to quote where he's like, you know, we're content playing, making, you know, playing mud castles in the in the gutter because we don't know what it means to be offered a vacation by the sea and he's like we're foolish people and we satisfy ourselves with drink and sex and all these things when when eternal life and joy forevermore have been offered to us and we're just like i don't want to eat the filet mignon i found an earthworm like don't eat the earthworm no and like uh, i don't want to cook the filet mignon it takes too long give me the earthworm i'm hopping on the plane to Tr- detroit let's do this Like, what are we doing? Guys, we're so close. Finish strong. Run the race with endurance that's set set before you, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Spend time with Jesus. More importantly, guys, delight yourself in Jesus. Or have a terrible Christian walk and wonder why it's not working. The choice is yours. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, great is your faithfulness, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. Your word is truth. And Lord, we pray that we would be spending time with you, Lord, that we would be delighting ourselves in you, Lord Jesus, because you are delightful, Lord. You are everything our hearts need, Lord. You are our shield and our exceedingly great reward. And Lord, we know that when we spend time with you, it'll give us that boldness. 
And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would work in the hearts of every one of us while our eyes are here closed this morning, Lord. And I pray that you would show us the things that you want to change about the way that we're spending our day, the way that we're spending our lives, our time, our treasure, our talents, what we're doing with all these different things, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you would show us what you want us to do with our lives, the plan that you have for us in you, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, keep us close to you. Help us to run this race that you've set before us with endurance, Lord Jesus, keeping our eyes on you. Because, Lord, you are worthy. And we know you're coming again soon. We know we're right here at the end. So strengthen us, Lord. Forgive us for being distracted by foolish things, Lord. And help us to spend our time wisely sojourning, Lord, knowing that the night is coming when no man can work. So, Lord, bless your servants as we seek your face, Lord, and bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just survive.